So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So yes, I'm going to talk about random three manifolds with boundary, uh, which is a joint pro project with uh, Jean Rambeau. Um, so I'm just going to start, uh, and I'd like to start with uh, with why. <laughs> so why what might one be interested in, in random three manifolds in general, or random manifolds? So my interest, my personal interest, and also that of Jean, mainly comes from geometry. Um, so the reasons we can think of to study these things um, are, well, first of all, uh, it gives some way to study a typical manifold, in particular, um, in particular uh, we're going to talk about geometry. It gives some way to, 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 to study manifolds of large volume. What does it, I mean, to answer questions of the form, what does a, a typical manifold of large volume look like? Um, on top of that, so I'm, I'm going to give uh, well, some examples of, of models at some point, but uh, on, um, I want to start with reasons. So on top of that, um, you can also use these models to test conjectures, meaning sometimes a conjecture uh, is too hard to prove, but these models often give you a way to study a, a really large set of manifolds all at once, and, and hence form a nice testing ground for conjectures. And sometimes. Sometimes uh, it is easier to prove a conjecture for a random manifold than it is to prove them for all manifolds. Conjectures. And then the final one is that there's, of course, the probabilistic method, which has also been uh, applied in this context, meaning uh, uh, sometimes you want to know about extremal properties uh, of, of manifolds. What is the manifold with the smallest diameter, uh, the, the largest uh, systole? Uh, things like that, and sometimes uh, it's easier to do that probabilistically, meaning sometimes it's easier to prove that in some ma uh, model for random manifolds, the probability that your random manifold has that prop extremal property is, is non-zero than to explicitly construct some uh, these manifolds. So this is probabilistic method. Probabilistic. Okay, so that would be why. And then uh, just to note that, uh, so Jean and I are definitely not the first people to study random manifolds. So there are plenty of models around, um, mostly in low dimension. So the, the best, uh, in, so I'm gonna talk about three manifolds um, uh, at some point, but uh, so the most studied model for random three manifolds is that of random Hegart splittings. Let me very briefly say what that is. This is a model introduced by Dunfield and Thurston. Um, so what is a Hegart splitting? You take two handle bodies, so meaning you take two surfaces and then you fill them up with smoke meaning two solid uh, surfaces like this, so three manifolds with boundary, twice of the same genus. And if I now take a homeomorphism between the, or dif say diffeomorphism between the, the boundaries of these two manifolds, so between these two surfaces of genus G in this case, then, um, then what I can do is I can build a manifold, which is this is handle body one and handle body two, then my three manifold would just be a handle body one, union handle body two, and then I quotient out by gluing x, oops, every point in the boundary of handle body one to its image under phi in the boundary of uh, handle body number two. So this gives you a manifold I mean, locally what phi does is you glue one half ball to another half ball, so locally at every point this thing looks like R3, so it's, so it's definitely a manifold. And um, so I'm not gonna go into this, but there's a way to pick phi randomly, so you, so you fix a genus, and then there's a way to pick phi randomly by, uh, you do this by a random walk on a group, which is called the mapping class group. Um, uh, but anyway, you can pick phi randomly, so you get a notion of a random. So 
you get. Um, so one reason that this is an interesting model for, for random manifolds is the fact that um, the fact that um, every closed three manifold, so compact no boundary, uh, admits such a decomposition. So, so every closed three manifold admits a Hegard splitting. Sorry? You, you put a differential structure or just uh, OBO? Dif differential structure. Does it, uh, in fact, uh, so this is, this, is, this is a fact from surface topology, but it turns out it doesn't matter. I can also, uh, okay, let, let me say it like this. So what if the, the, the fact is if I wiggle uh, this, this thing a little bit, it doesn't change the differential structure or the, the, the topology of the resulting space here. So in particular, what I really want to do is I want to pick a diffeomorphism or a homeomorphism mod isotopy. Mm -hmm. And then there's a fact from surface topology that uh, mod isotopy, I can always assume it's a diffeomorphism or a homeomorphism. So it doesn't matter. Another, another way to say the same thing is that if two three manifolds are diffeomorphic, uh, sorry, homeomorphic, they're also diffeomorphic. So in, in, in dimension three, this doesn't matter yet. And so then you, you got a discrete space in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, a, it's really a, it's a it's a, yeah, it's a random walk on a group, so it's a, um, um, it's actually now I can, since I've already said it, so uh, diffio, self diffeomorphisms of a surface uh, of genus 2, modulo isotopy, form, form a group, the mapping class group, and you, this is finitely generated, so you can do a random walk on it, that, that's, that's what this is. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and so every closed three manifold admits such a, a splitting, so this is also, if you are willing to uh, accept the fact that every closed three manifold admits a triangulation, this is also not so hard to see. But, so triangulation is a decomposition into tetrahedra. Uh, and what can I do if I take the one skeleton of that, so the edges of the triangulation, and I, I thicken those, I get a, a handle body. And the complement is a thickening of the dual graph uh, to, the, to the triangulation. That's also a handle body, so that gives you Hegard splitting. The, 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 so this is the good news. The bad news is that uh, it's not true that every three manifold admits a Hegard splitting of genus two. So if I want to get every manifold, I do need to let the genus of these, uh, these things go up. So let me add that, but not all bounded genus. So in particular, so this model has been used to answer questions of the second and the third type, uh, but it's, it's not a great model for a typical manifold. Because it's, a, it's a good model for a typical manifold of a fixed Hegar genus. Um, all right. Then, uh, as many of you know, there is also the, uh, well, sorry, let me say one more thing about three manifolds. So given such a random homeomorphism, there's another uh, construction you can do. Mapping to R I. So another thing you could do, if I have a random self-homeomorphism of a surface, so if I a sigma is a, a, a or a diffeomorphism doesn't matter. Uh, so sigma is closed surface. Another thing I can do is I can thicken my surface. n phi, I can thicken it and then glue the top to the bottom with, uh, so this is a, this is a three manifold with boundary, two boundary components, uh, the surface cross zero and the surface cross one. And I can use my self homeomorphism to, to glue that together. And that gives me a three manifold. So x zero goes to phi of x one for all x uh, in sigma. Uh, in sigma. 
that gives me a, another model for a random three manifold. Now it's no longer true that I obtain all uh, three manifolds. So not every three manifold is of this form. There's a, there's a famous theorem of a couple of years ago due to Egel that most manifolds have a, have a finite degree cover that is of this form. So it's not, it's not so bad. But again, if I want to get all manifolds, I need to let the genus of the surface go up. And it turns out, uh, there's something I'm not really going to talk about, but it turns out that geometrically, uh, these two models are very similar, actually. So the type of manifolds I get here are very similar to the type of manifolds I get there. So, so just to be sure, then in the end, you can only ask for topological question, not metric question. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's true. Not yet, yeah. So, this, it's, so far, this is all just topology. That's true. Um, all right, and then, uh, as many of you know, there's also lots of, so it's going to be the three manifold, but there's lots of uh, models for random two manifolds as well, of course. You can pick a random triangulation. Um, you can, uh, or you also, if you want to do geometry, you have spaces of, of metrics on, on surfaces, and there's ways to pick random points in those. And there are lots of, there are lots of models out there. So what Jean and I wanted to look at uh, is this question of typical manifolds. So for that, these Hegard splittings or these mapping tori are not that satisfactory. Um, so you want to try something else. So if you, if you know random surfaces, you can, you can do that by randomly gluing triangles together. So the first thing you think of uh, would be to take tetrahedra instead and randomly match those up uh, along their faces. <laughs> so this is, in the, this is in the quest for, let's say, typical manifolds. So, but the problem is, as I'm sure most of you know too, uh, is that that doesn't work. So the, the, version of proof that I know comes from the same pa paper by Dunfield and Thurston. So what do I do? So here's a model. I just take n tetrahedra, I randomly match up the faces, and then per pair of faces, uh, I, uh, opt I mean, optohomeomorphism say I have a choice of three gluings uh, if I want to get an oriented manifold. I uniformly pick, uh, pick one of three per face matching, and that gives me a random manifold, or gives me a random complex. <laughs> but the problem is that the probability that that actually gives me a manifold tends to zero. So let me just write down what I mumbled in words. Uh, a random uh, gluing of n tetrahedra. Uh, is a manifold. This probability tends to zero as n tends to infinity. Uh, so let me show you where that comes from. I won't give a full proof, but um, so what? What is a, what is the problem? So first of all, what is a manifold? A manifold is, is one of these complexes in which every point has a neighborhood homeomorphic to a bit of R three. Um, so you see that if I'm in the interior of this tetrahedra, there's no problem. Likewise, if I'm in the interior of one of the two-dimensional faces, I glue two half balls together, that's fine. Like, and, and finally, if I'm in the interior of an edge, that's also okay, because I glue a couple of these wedges together along these edges, that's also a three ball. So the problem is the vertices. So. So let's look at the link of the vertices. So the, the surface formed by these little triangles here. So the observation is just that if I want my complex to be a three manifold, then the neighborhood of the vertex is supposed to be a ball. So these links better form spheres. Um, so links need to be spheres. What does that mean? Well, the, um, the, the vertices, so these, these spheres are triangulated. The vertices of these spheres correspond two to one to the edges of my complex. Um, 
So, uh, and if, if I want them to be spheres, an Euler characteristic computation gives me that I need to have lots of vertices of degree at most six. Uh, in particular, if I, so if I look around these edges, that gives me lots of cycles in the dual graph of, of, of length at most six. Um, so, and the dual graph is just a four regular graph, and four regular graphs don't have lots of cycles of, of, of bounded length. So I need to have lots of cycles of length at most six in dual graph. And that just doesn't happen. Okay, so that, 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 that's roughly how the proof goes. And then, uh, um, so, 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 so the observation is, in particular, that the problem is just at the vertices of these complexes. So, hence the title. So if you truncate these tetrahedra at their vertices, the problem goes away. So you get a random three manifold. The only thing is you get one with boundary. So that's, that's what uh, Jean and I studied. get a polytope that looks something like this. Uh, so it has some, some triangular faces that come from these vertices and some hexagonal faces that come from the faces of the original tetrahedron. And what we're going to do is we're going to match the hexagonal faces up randomly and then and, and with and per, per matched pair of faces, I'm going to pick one out of three gluings uh, uh, at random. That gives me a random manifold. So, glue randomly. So you get, this is what we're going to call uh, truncate glue. Uh, so MN is the, is, is the random gluing, but N tetrahedra. That's the, I, I'm, lying, I'm lying a little bit here. So actually what we want also, what we want to do, so this is not so hard if you know random regular graphs. The, um, we want to condition on the dual graph. So the graph you get if I put a vertex in every truncated tetrahedron and I draw four edges through the, um, uh, through the hexagonal faces and I match them according to the same pattern I matched my, 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 my polytopes. Uh, I want this dual graph not to have uh, loops or, uh, or, or multiple edges. So I want this dual graph to be simple. But simple dual graph. So what, uh, graph. this is, so this is, a, this is a, I mean, a priori is maybe not such an unnatural condition, but this really, uh, for us, is really something that comes up in, in one of the lemmas we need at some point. Uh, this is, for us, is really a technical condition. Uh, in particular, this condition uh, is, is weaker than asking that the complex is simplicial. Uh, so simplicial means that, uh, that uh, every pair of tetrahedra share at most one face, um, every pair of vertices share at most one edge, et cetera, et cetera. That, that is stronger than that condition. Um, what did I want to say? Ah, yeah, so, so this, the, the, like I said before, the, the dual graph of this is a, is a random uh, regular graph. The, the, I mean, in reality, the model we are studying is the configuration model for random regular graphs. Um, so if you know this model well, you know that this, uh, if I let the number of tetrahedra or the number of vertices of the graph tend to infinity, this has positive probability asymptotically. And all the things I'm going to talk about are zero, one probabilities, so, they, uh, so this won't really uh, be a restriction. Okay. All right, so that's the model. Just 
Yeah. I'm fairly sure. So in terms of the configuration model, you've got this uh, tetravalent pods. Mm -hmm. You have an orientation of the the four legs. I have an orient. No, I have an orientation of the four uh, the four faces. So I have an orientation of the four faces, uh, and then per uh, per per identified pair of half edges, I choose one out of three uh, orientation reversing matchings. Okay. okay, so that's the model. So next up is what do we want to know about it? Um, so first of all, of course, we want to know the topology. Um, so for instance, uh, is it connected? This manifold, I allow all gluings, so in particular disconnected ones. If you know random regular graphs, you know that the answer is yes, because the, the dual graph is connected if and only if my, uh, my complex is connected. Um, then I can ask for the boundary. So what is the number of boundary components, for instance? How many components do I get if I glue these in terms of, sorry, these, these little triangles here are going to form boundary components. How many do I get? Components and then what are there uh, then these boundary components are closed surfaces so and they're oriented um, so the question is the only question that remains is what are their genera of the boundary in fact so the, let me let me spoil uh, give a tiny spoiler so the answer here is one, so this is really the genus of the boundary. But uh, um, uh, And then, of course, you, we can ask uh, three-dimensional topological properties. So, for instance, what are the Betty numbers of my uh, complex? Betty numbers are, for instance, so associated to this manifold with boundary, um, I also have a, a closed manifold. I can double it, meaning I just take two copies of my manifold. They, I mean, it's twice the same manifold, so they have the same boundary. So I can just glue them together with the identity. That gives me a manifold without boundary. And then I can, for instance, ask what is the Higar genus of that thing? So how, what is the minimal genus I need to decompose it into two handle bodies of uh, double Um, and then, so that's the topology. And then there's geometric questions you can ask. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll get to uh, this in a moment, what hyperbolic geometry is, but there's a natural question, it turns out. So, so there's a natural question is, what, can, can, I put, can I put a nice metric on this? And the question, and the nice here means hyperbolic. So it does. Mn who carry a hyperbolic metric. So it has boundary. So I really have to, uh, so I'm going to ask if it has totally geodesic boundary. Geodesic boundary. That just means okay, hyperb a hyperbolic metric is a, let me say it in words, hyperbolic metric is a Riemannian metric. Um, so what I can ask uh, is, is how the boundary sits in, and it, totally geodesic means that locally the shortest path between two points uh, is contained in, uh, in, in the boundary is contained in the boundary. Um, um, what did I? So that, um, and then, uh, okay, <laughs> if so. Uh, what are its properties? So, 
So before I get to the answers that, uh, that John and I uh, found, do a quick reminder on the, on, on the geometry part. So let me just start with dimension two. So the question is, so, 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 so my, my claim here is that even if you care about the topology, you should also care about this question, whether, whether there's a hyperbolic metric, and if so, what are the properties of this metric? Let me explain where that, why, why that is. Um, and so let me first start with dimension two. So as, as, as you know, in dimension two, um, say closed orientable manifolds are completely uh, classified. Uh, so let me say, uh, let me add some adjectives. I mean, it does, it's not necessary. You can classify all of them, but say closed, so compact, no boundary, and orientable. So what is the classification of services? It tells you that if I have a, a two-dimensional manifold, if it's closed and orientable, then it's necessarily diffeomorphic to one of a countable list, namely the, the sphere, the torus, the surface of genus two, et cetera. Um, and there's a way, so already in dimension two, there's a way to look at this geometrically. So, so, so now, Suppose I want to study metrics on these surface, surfaces. So there's a fact that um, every, uh, every one of these surfaces admits uh, what is called a constant curvature metric. So every such surface admits a uh, Ramanian metric. metric of constant curvature either um, so you can you can all and after that you can scale so you only uh, each one of them admits a Ramanian metric of constant curvature uh, minus one zero or plus one what does that so uh, what does that mean so curv constant curvature plus one that means that Every uh, point has a neighborhood that is isometric to a neighborhood in the round sphere. So just the, the, the two sphere embedded in R3 with its, with its induced metric. So this is, uh, so locally your manifold looks like the round sphere. So that is called spherical geometry. Then zero, uh, that means locally uh, Locally, you just look like R2 with its usual metric. Uh, so that would be Euclidean geometry. And then, in many ways, the most important one, uh, uh, hyperbolic geometry. So constant curvature minus one. What does that mean? Loc locally, you look like the, the hyperbolic plane. What, is that? What, what does that geometrically mean, roughly? That means that locally, you look, you look like a saddle. So every point has a so every point has a neighborhood that looks like this, meaning, and so it's negative curvature because around this point, if I look sort of in the direction out of the board, it curves in one way, and if I look along the board, it curves in the opposite way. And and constant curvature minus one means just that uh, this the, the way this curves is uh, first of all constant and also in both directions is the same. Uh, and this would be hyperbolic geometry. Geometry. And then moreover, so every such surface admits such a metric, one of these. Uh, moreover, this, which one it admits also determines the topology. Meaning, uh, if it admits a spherical metric, then it has to be the, the two-sphere. If it admits a flat metric, it has to be a torus. And if it admits, admits a hyperbolic metric, it has to be a surface of at least of genus at least two. So let me write down uh, here let me make a table genus. Um, so this is at least two. 
Um, this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is genus one and this is genus zero. All right, so in particular, uh, and this really exists, so originally the proof of this classification is completely a topological proof, but, in, but, but using this, you can also imagine a proof where you start with this, with the fact that every surface admits a constant curvature metric, and then you try to say, okay, so now, now I know that it's a hyperbolic surface, which hyperbolic surfaces are there, and then you can make the list of ge surfaces of genus at least two. Same for Euclidean, the same for spherical. And this, so this proof does exist. Uh, this, this does work, this idea. And in particular, so, so this, I think, Zorek already convinced you that even if you're just interested in topology, putting a metric on your uh, manifold is, is, is useful. Uh, and it, in, in particular, uh, in dimension three, uh, it's so far the only way we have of doing such proofs. So in dimension three, closed manifolds are not at all classified. So it's way too hard to, class it, to, make, a, to, to make a list like this. Um, but you, there, there's a simil similar strategy. So this is, this is what was, uh, let's see, where am I? Yeah. The geometrization program of Thurston, which was famously sold by Perelman. Uh, so Thurston geometrization. Oh, sorry, let me add. Thurston Perelman. Thurston already solved a lot of cases, and then and, well, Perelman did, did, the, did the general case. So the idea is the same. So instead of, of, of trying to do a classification by topology, you say, you try to prove that every manifold admits a certain geometry, and then you try to understand uh, geometric manifolds. So, so this, in dimension three, the situation is already much more complicated. So uh, in particular, in dimension two, we had three geometries. In dimension three, there are eight of them. Um, so, um, um, so what do you have? You have the analogues of those three. So you have uh, three-dimensional spherical geometry, the geometry of the three-sphere as, as a subset of R4. So S3, you have uh, three-dimensional Euclidean geometry, geometry of R3. There's a, there's a three-dimensional analog of the hyperbolic plane, hyperbolic three-space. Um, and then there's a couple others. So first of all, a thing you can do is you can take a sphere and you can cross it with a flat line, and you can do the same with the hyperbolic plane. You can do the same with, uh, with R2, of course, but then you just get R3 back. So you have uh, H2 cross R, a, uh, S2 cross R, so those, and you, this, this is already R2 cross R. And then there's a couple more. So there's the, doesn't matter so much, I'm not gonna really use this. Just want to convince you that, that even if you just want to do topology, geometry is useful. So you have the, topolo the geometry of the universal cover of SL2R. And then uh, you have two geometries that are called nil and sol, nil potent and solvable. Um, all right. And so now, what, what is the program here? So it's, it's, again, the idea is inspired by the, the, the two dimensional case. You put a metric on the manifold and then you try to classify. Um, here it's more complicated, so what the real theorem says is you can cut up your manifold uh, into pieces and every piece uh, admits one of these geometries. And then you can try to classify the pieces. So, like I said, this doesn't lead to a classification. So, so no classification. Well, it leads to lots of other stuff. stuff. For instance, I mean, the most famous consequence is the Poincaré conjecture. Poincaré conjecture said that if you have a closed three manifold and it's simply connected, so you can contract every, every, every circle, then it has to be the three sphere. And that, that was not known up until Perelman solved, uh, solved this. Okay, and, 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 and lots more. But anyway, so, so the, 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 the message I want to uh, send is, is it's even, so if you want to do topology in three dimensions, it's a good idea to, to try to put a metric on your manifold. 
Moreover, out of this long list of manifolds, the, the, <laughs> the hardest to understand is definitely the, the hyperbolic case. So there's, there's classification theorems for, other, uh, for, for the other uh, manifolds. And it's also the most typical one in, in many ways. So in particular, most of these models of random three manifolds, the probability that the result is hyperbolic is one. <laughs> when you say the result is hyperbolic, you first have to cut into pieces or? No, no, directly. There's no, there, there's no, there's no way to cut it into pieces and the, 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 the one manifold you have is hyperbolic. Most typical. So I don't know. <laughs> don't know whether this convinces you, but that's also definitely true in dimension two, right? Like among all surfaces, hyper the hyperbolic ones are definitely the most typical. I mean, the yeah, if you put one of this uh, metric, mm -hmm. uh, then it's uh, injective. I mean, you cannot put two metrics on the same uh, surface. Yes. Yeah. That is that is that is true. Yeah. There is no. Uh, um, in some cases, yes. <laughs> For instance, um, um, well, for in, okay, for instance, if you know, in particular, if you, for instance, if you know um, that it's H3, you know that uh, if you take a, the universal cover of the manifold, it has to be H3. Um, in particular, that is a contractible manifold, so it can definitely not be S3. Um, then uh, if it's a closed manifold, you also know, so, there's geometric group theory, so if, if there's, there's, um, I don't want to go into details of that, but you know that if it's closed, the, the fundamental group is quasi-isometric to the hyper hyperbolic three space. I mean, roughly what that means is if you, if you look at the fundamental group without your glasses, you see hyperbolic three space. Uh, that is definitely not true for, for R3, for instance, uh, and, and similarly for these ones. So, so yes, it's sort of, you, the, you can patch together proofs of, of that, like that. Um, all right, and then, there's, oh yeah, there's one final piece of, of three-dimensional geometry I want to mention, which is now specifically about hyperbolic geometry, um, which is a, a classical theorem due to Mostow. For the, and there's a generalization by Prasad for manifolds of finite volume, but if, if, what, what Mostow says that if, if I have two hyperbolic manifolds, M and N are hyperbolic with totally geodesic boundary, and they happen to be homeomorphic, M is homeomorphic to N, then in fact they're isometric. So this is really um, three manifolds, or four or five or above, but not two manifolds. Um, then they're isometric. So let me say why this is special. So in fact, uh, on the surface of genus two, uh, I, I can, so I, I just said I can put a, a hyperbolic metric on this, a metric of constant curvature minus one. But in fact, I can put lots of them uh, on there. And I have, a, uh, I have a, in case of genus two, I have a six dimensional space of non pairwise non-isometric metrics on this thing. So, so that violates Mostow in a very strong way because all, in particular, all these manifolds in that space are homeomorphic, but they're definitely not isometric. So, so Mostow, but Mostow tells you that that stops in dimension three. You don't have a deformation space of hyperbolic metrics on a, on a, on a manifold, closed three manifold. In particular, it tells you that hyper, uh, invariants of this metrics, metric are topological invariants, meaning if your manifold is hyperbolic, it, it carries a unique such metric. So for instance, the topology determines the volume of the, of the manifold. So now, <laughs> if I can prove that my random complexes are hyperbolic manifolds, then I get, automatically, I get a the canonical way of putting a hyperbolic metric on it, and its volume is, is determined just by the combinatorics of the gluing. And, and by nothing else. All right. So, yeah, so just, I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a 
huge body of literature on three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry, so there's lots more to say, uh, but that doesn't fit in the talk. So I'm now going to move back to the model. So now I have two questions. Uh, um, what is the topology of our manifolds? And, and, uh, and what is their geometry if they are hyperbolic? Let me say what we can prove. First of all, there's the two, so this, this is the joint work with Jill. So first of all, uh, we have the topology. So um, so first of all, the basic thing that I already mentioned, these manifolds are connected. Uh, moreover, their boundary is connected. Mn is connected uh, and has a single boundary component. If you uh, this, this uh, maybe if you think about random triangulations, often this is this is not so surprising. So I already said that. Connectedness is, is equivalent to connectedness of random regular graphs. And then the fact that the boundary has a single boundary component or that the boundary is connected, that just means that if I look at the gluing of these, of these triangles as a, as a random surface, I, um, then, then the result is connected. So if I do this, it's well known that if I do this one pair of triangles at a time, uh, the result is connected. Here, that's not true. I glue them three at a time. But, uh, but, but sort of it's close enough to, to, to doing it one triangle at the time that the result is still connected. Um, okay, moreover, um, just like for uh, random surfaces, the genus is large, as large as it could possibly be. So, so just from counting the number, yeah, I have n tetrahedra, so I have four n triangles in the boundary. Uh, so just, I can do an Euler characteristic computation. The genus is going to be at most n, and it turns out that uh, it, is, it is actually uh, asymptotic to n in probability. Then... Um, what else do we have? So actually, we, we even have error terms. So that, uh, that error term is, is, is any function that grows faster than a logarithm of n uh, works as an error term here. Um, and then, well, I don't know. Then there's the Betty numbers. We can also control those. So let me just uh, mn. So first of all, you can ask how much of the homology comes from the boundary. So it turns out that very little, oh sorry, almost all of it, sorry. So if I look at the homology rel boundary, I get uh, uh, at most logarithmic boundary, uh, Betty numbers to say, and well, uh, I already know that I have homology in the boundary because the genus is, 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 is of size n. But, uh, and, and I, with this, the fact that inside there's not so much, I get that uh, the, the actual Betty number of the manifold is, is, is n. And also, uh, let me not write it down each time, but this is true in probability uh, as n tends to infinity. Okay. Then, um, then there's the geometry. So of course, the reason that I talked about hyperbolic geometry is that these manifolds do admit a hyperbolic metric. So let me say, let me just say Mn is hyperbolic with totally geodesic boundary.
this, this happens. So then again, Mostow tells me that means it has a unique hyperbolic metric. And then we can say a bunch of things about the geometry of that metric. So, so um, let me just do a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, we can control the volume. So hyperbolic volume. Um, Uh, it's asymptotic to uh, a linear, it's linear in the number of uh, truncated tetrahedra with a, a constant that is uh, explicit, even though I don't know the uh, value by heart. But the O is the volume of an ideal right angled octahedron in um, H3. All right, so okay. octahedron is, a, is an octahedron. Here's H3. I can draw H3 as a ball. Ideal means that this, this octahedron has all its vertices on the boundary. So let me just draw it uh, like this. Hoppa, and here one in the bottom. And a right angle just means that the uh, the angles here are all right, and it just turns out that this 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 phrase determines the polytope up to isometry. Uh, if I say this, I can up to isometries of hyperbolic three space. I can only find one such thing. So it has a well-defined volume, and that shows up exactly as the growth rate of the volume of our manifolds. Um, and then um, then um, then just like. I don't know if you've thought about these random surfaces by hyperbolic random surfaces by Brooks and Macover before, or random regular graphs. They share many of those properties, meaning they're highly connected. For instance, um, just like uh, graphs, uh, hyperbolic manifolds have a, have a, a first Laplacian eigenvalue, and um, this this does not tend to zero. Or if, or if you want, there's an analog to the isoparametric constant for hyperbolic manifolds too. Uh, that does not tend to zero either. Let me say it in terms of the Laplacian. Um, the probability that spectral gap is more than that tends to one and then tends to infinity. And um, maybe a more geometric way of saying the same thing, just like a regular graph, uh, you can bound the diameter of a uh, so the diameter of a, a four valent random of a four valent regular graph on n vertices is at least a log to the base three of n. Uh, likewise, there's a logarithmic lower bound on diameters of hyperbolic manifolds, and uh, it turns out for these for these random manifolds there's also an upper bound. So there's a C D more than zero, such that the probability that the diameter of this is more than CD times log of, uh, um, let's say, the volume of my manifold, which plays the role of the number of vertices of the, of the graph or the number of tetrahedra. All right, so in, just like logarithmic diameter is, is means your graph is highly connected, this means that my hyperbolic manifold is, is highly connected. See how much time I have. Ah, 12 minutes. All right. And then, then well, let me not write them down. We have some control over uh, short, short curves as well, just like you have control over short cycles in a, in, a, in a random graph. All right, so this is what we know. Um, are there any questions up, up until to this point? Yes. So just to be sure, if I give you the combinatorics of the boundary, mm -hmm. then there is still uh, some unknown on the full topology of the three guy. Yes, or? yeah, definitely. For instance, uh, I mean, for the... And, and, and is um, it true also on a, in, the, in, the, in the random case? I mean, if, if, I, if I give you yeah. the, the boundary, the 
exactly the map, the two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, is there still randomness? Um, well, if you give me the labeled combinatorics of the boundary, then no. Uh, not the labeled, just no, the map from just the, 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 the triangles. Um, let me think. Um, Okay, I have to think about that, but I think I think the answer is yes. I think there's still some uh, some 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 freedom in the in the middle left. Um, but the, it, the, I mean this 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 question. I mean this is a good question because it is true that um, lots of the things we do in the proofs. I'll I'll give a very vague sketch in a moment. Uh, can be translated into studying the the map on the on the boundary actually. Actually, let me do that now. So, so the, the goal is to, the goal is very simple. The goal is to understand the combinatorics of the complex and then translate that into geometry and, and these topology uh, statements. So what goes into the proof? So, so, okay. <laughs> So this, of course, we have to understand the, the combinatorics of the complex. What we use for this is, uh, is, is sort of is, is, is peeling methods. So these are well known in the study of maps. Uh, so, so, so we use ex in, in reality we use very simple uh, peeling algorithms to understand uh, the, the, the combinatorics of our complex. This already. Uh, I erased, I just erased all of them, but this, uh, in reality, this already gives you the, the, the um, this already gives you all the topology I, I put on the board. The topology, the topology statement follows directly from that. So the, the co connectivity, well, the connectivity, the, the genus of the boundary, the, the, the Betty numbers, the Higart genus, all that follows from, uh, from, from understanding the combinatorics of the complex. And then, uh, so that's the combinatoric side of it at, then there's the, the geometry side of that, of, of the proof. So how, does, how do you go from the combinatorics of the complex to, to that? This, is, this comes out of a, a set of... You didn't mention your result on the Iker genius. Talked about the genus. Uh, yeah, oh, the sorry. Genus, uh, oops, I, I skipped. Accidentally skipped it. So the Higer genus is linear, uh, just like the... And we, uh, the, the, also there we have the... So the Higer genus is asymptotic to one, uh, to, sorry, to n, one times n in probability. Then, uh, yes. So the, 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 the geometry we get out of uh, a set of techniques from hyperbolic geometry, of course, which, uh, which is known as Dane filling. So this was started, also this was started by Thurston. And the, the, the actual results we use are due to Futter, Schleimer, and Purcell. So these, are, these are hyperbolic geometry theorems. And um, they, I mean, their results are sort of the most general, general version possible of uh, results due to um, Brock and Bromberg, and before them, uh, Hodgson and Kirchhoff. All right, so let me first, I first want to tell you about the, so the thing, first want to tell you about the geometry side. Because I also think that there are the people in the audience who know much more about peeling than me. And our, our peeling algorithms are very, uh, are really very simple. Um, so, um, so what is Dane filling? So this this uh, so Dane filling is a is a process where if I have a three manifold with boundary, so if M N sorry to M sorry M is just a topological three manifold, so three manifold with a boundary. And the boundary happens to be uh, homeomorphic to a torus. So it's, it's, it's a three-manifold boundary, so its boundary is a surface. 
And that just happens to be the, the two torques. Then uh, I, can build, uh, I can build a closed three manifold out of this by, by filling up the two torus, meaning I take a solid torus and I glue it in. So that's what Dane filling is. So, so, so take, take a solid torus, torus, and a bit like these Hegert splittings, um, take a solid torus, and then I take a homeomorphism um, between the boundary, so phi, say, is a, is a homeomorphism between, this is T, the boundary of my solid torus T, and the boundary of my manifold. Uh, well, that's not fantastic, but all right. I take a homeomorphism between the, the boundary of my torus and the boundary of the manifold, which happens to be a torus. Then, uh, then I can build a manifold. So M phi is called, uh, so this is just M union my solid torus, and then I quotient out, like before, I glue x to phi x uh, for all x in uh, the boundary of my torus. All right, so I get some three manifold. It turns out, actually, that the topology of this three manifold is completely determined by the, where this curve goes. So this curve goes, it's a homeomorphism, so this curve goes to some closed curve on the boundary of M, on the tor boundary torus of M. And it turns out that if I just look at the, the homotopy class of, 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 uh, in the image, that completely determines the, the result. In fact, so up to Diffio, M5 is determined by, so let me call this little curve gamma here, uh, the homotopy class. So again, the, 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 the fundamental group of, of the torus is Z2. So I just, what I just need to give you to determine the Dane filling is a pair of integers. Homotopy class of um, phi of gamma. All right. Okay. So now again, so now, so the conclusion is if I, if I give you a, a manifold with boundary, that is a torus, and I give you a pair of integers, I get a closed manifold. Um, all right. So what is this? This is still topology. But then um, it happens. So, so a typical thing, sorry, I should have started with that. A typical manifold to have in mind for, for, for my manifold with toroidal boundary is the complement of a knot. So if I take, uh, if I take this, um, I think it's this. So, so this is an embedding of the circle in R3. Uh, if I compactify R3 by adding a point at infinity, I get the three sphere. So if I take, if I take out an open neighborhood of the circle, I get uh, the three sphere minus, minus a solid torus. So, I get, a, so I, get, I get some manifold with toroidal boundary. Um, okay, and then the, the idea is of course, I can glue my, my, my knot back and I get exactly the same manifold back, but I can also glue it back with a twist. I can, I can glue, if I, so originally, here's, here's a curve, originally this, this curve was attached here. I can choose a different curve and, and, a diff, and a different homeomorphism that attaches it to something else. And a priori I get a different manifold that is not, no longer homeomorphic to the three sphere. Um, and in, in particular, the, the manifold you get is very different. So this, these are ideas by Thurston, because it turns out, uh, I, I chose the figure eight knot for a reason. It turns out that this, the complement of this in S3 carries a hyperbolic metric. So the, the three sphere does not carry a hyperbolic metric at all. But I can put, on the complement of this, I can put a complete hyperbolic metric of finite volume. So, so this is the global, the global idea, which is due to Thurston. Thurston. Um, if um, uh, M is hyperbolic, so I mean it has a complete hyperbolic metric of uh, finite volume, then for all but finitely many gluings, many Dane fillings, 
So again, uh, Dane filling is determined by a pair of integers. So for, for all but finitely many pairs of integers, the, the resulting manifold, closed manifold is also hyperbolic. Uh, M phi is also hyperbolic, meaning it carries a hyperbolic metric. And um, the way he proves this is actually, uh, he proves that if you take longer and longer curves on the boundary, uh, so if you tend to infinity in, in, in Z2, the, the, this, this, this manifold actually converges to the hyperbolic manifold, to the, to the, to the manifold uh, without the torus in some way. Okay, but so after Thurston there's, but the, the, the moral is sort of, it's hyperbolic and moreover, if you take a really long curve, uh, then the geometry is even pretty close of the closed manifold and the open manifold. With, with one stark difference, so the, 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 the open manifold has infinite diameter, so it has a complete metric, so, so uh, sort of the, the and there's some sort of cusp around these, it's, it's a bit hard to imagine, but there's a sort of a cusp around uh, these, uh, these, these, these tori that you take out. So this is, this is um, so in particular it has infinite diameter, um, and, but if you look at the parts where the inductivity radius is large, meaning where, where, where you have large embedded balls, then that's pretty close. Uh, the longer you take the curve along which you fill, the closer the geometry of these two manifolds. If the filling is along a long curve, the geometry, the geometry is close. Ah, okay. All right, I see. I need to stop. So let me just in one minute say what this has to do with our random manifolds and then I stop. I'm just going to draw a picture. So the idea is, so again, I, and oh sorry, let me just say, Futter, Purcell and Schleimer make this very quantitative. So, 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 Futter, so you get actual, when I say close, you get actual Lipschitz constants between the different metrics. And now what does this have to do with our manifolds? Let me start with my tetrahedron. What I can do is these so in, in my random gluing, these, these blue edges here, they're interior to the manifold. They don't lie on the boundary. What I can do is I can contract them. Um, and I'm the one on the back as well. If I do that to all edges, I get exactly an octahedron. Um, it's a bit hard to draw. Uh, maybe it takes a second to wrap your mind around this, but it's, I mean, in particular, all these hexagonal faces become triangles, so I get an octahedron. And now, <laughs> now I know, let me just draw, let me not try to draw a, a sort of a picture of what happens after, uh, after collapsing these edges, but let me just draw an octahedron. And the vertices of this octahedron come from these, where, where once the edges were. And now there's just the fact that I know there's an ideal right-angled hyperbolic octahedron. So I have a hyperbolic metric on this thing. So I can glue these octahedra in the same pat pattern that I glue my truncated polytopes. That gives, me a, that gives me a hyperbolic metric on a complex of octahedra. And moreover, what, what, if to go from here to here, that means that I replace these things, these points here, by, by solid cylinders. So in particular, in, do, in the double, I replace these points here by solid tori. So the, the, this thing is a Dane filling of that thing along a very specific curve. So the combinatorics of the, around these interior edges give you lengths of, 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 of the Dane fillings and hence control over the geometry. And, but in particular, it's good enough to, for instance, show that the, volumes, the volume doesn't decrease too much. So the volume, uh, the volume is exactly n times the volume of this thing, whatever it is. All right, and I think that's a good point to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. I mean, there is the obvious question, uh, which is, uh, is, is there any hope to do something where you, you fix the topology of the, of the three manifolds that you are, that you are considering? 
and then look at tri random triangulations yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. To be honest, I I don't really know because the I mean, it, it, as many of you probably know, it's really hard to even count triangulations of three manifolds, right? It's not even known how many triangulations with n-tetrahedra the three-sphere has. Uh, so I think I, I don't know by heart, but the best bounds are between something like n factorial to the power of one over six and, and, and uh, exponential or something. So, um, I, so I wouldn't know how to, how to do that with uh, speci spe uh, specifically not with uh, with this.